Hey, everybody. I am super excited for this episode's guest, Brian Kirkpatrick. Brian is sitting down with me and telling me awesome stories about his grandfather, who you guys are not going to believe at what age he joined the Army. You guys are also going to be blown away by all the different aspects of Brian's grandfather's life. He is absolutely an amazing story and an amazing example of not only being a grandfather, but also an individual who did so many different things in his life that it's very inspiring to know that people can go from interest to interest, job to job, and still maintain great relationships with their family and putting their family first. So without further ado, let's jump into our conversation. Hello and welcome to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. This is your host, Greg Payne, coming at you from Studio 12. This podcast is about being the best possible grandpa you can be, focusing on what it is to be a grandpa and how we can all share that experience together for our grandchildren. Hey, Brian, thanks for being on the Cool Grandpa Podcast. I really enjoy uh, the fact that we're sitting here and you're taking time uh, to visit with me and, and tell me stories and tell me about your grandfather. So really do appreciate this opportunity. And as we get started, how about you just tell us a little bit about your grandfather, introduce him to us and, and let us know a little bit about his background. Thanks. So uh, my grandfather, my mom's father is uh, James C. Good. And he was born, I don't know the exact date, but in 1930, so he grew up through the Great Depression and all of that and actually uh, lied about his age and joined the Army at the age of 15. But it was right after World War II. So he ended up over in Germany for a lot of the, the reconstruction activities and everything that they were doing over there while he was active duty in the Army. And then after he left the Army, he came back um, to Wyoming and somewhere along the lines, he moved to Thermopolis, which is where my grandmother lived. And that's actually where my mom grew up. And of course, you know, all of that, I don't really know anything about cause I wasn't born yet, but, um, somewhere along the lines, they ended up moving to Casper, Wyoming, which is where I was born and raised and grew up. And my grandpa basically taught himself how to fly. Oh, okay. Uh, he became a, a professional pilot for uh, Amoco Pipeline, and he used to fly just checking to make sure that there weren't leaks and stuff. So he'd fly, you know, 40 hours a week up in a Cessna just checking pipeline. Kind of a brush pilot, probably low to the ground, looking for those puddles of oil or whatnot for the yes. busted pipes. Yeah, exactly. And I... I think he actually did some like crop dusting and stuff like that before he got in with the pipeline. So he, he's flown a number of different aircraft, um, you know, everything from a Cessna all the way through up to, uh, an old, uh, constellation is okay. what they called it. Uh, the constellations were actually the first air force one aircraft. It was right. like a prop aircraft, um, with a big like triple tail on it. Yeah, so. yeah. That was, uh, I think it was Eisenhower's, uh, I think Eisenhower may have started that, but he, he was a big fan of the Connie and uh, kind of a luxury liner. It's similar to how they use the 747s and uh, some of the jets now is that that's the class, just for people that don't know, that's the kind of the classification that the Connie was in. And I, I believe somewhere along the lines, I don't know how he got it, but he got the galley out of the original Air Force One. And that was actually in his museum at his hangar for a number of years. And uh, a company out here in Virginia actually uh, was rebuilding the first Air Force One Constellation aircraft, got in touch with my grandpa, and they were able to get the original galley back to reinstall into the aircraft. Oh, wow. Um, and that was... I can't remember the name of the company right now, but they're actually local out here in Virginia. Okay. Now, because I, I want to explore further the whole uh, flight and, and how your grandfather taught himself to fly and 
um, how he got into aviation, especially after coming out of World War II, the occupation forces in Germany, and then going back into Wyoming. But uh, what was one of your earliest memories of your grandfather? And, and so I remember uh, mostly the house that um, they lived in out in an area outside of Casper, Wyoming called Vista West. And it was a fairly big house. It was on four levels. And I just remember going over there when I was really little. And uh, they used to have a couple of little poodles. And my grandpa had one. It was his dog named Curly. And he was a toy poodle, but you wouldn't know it. He was mean <laughs> and he would come up and when my brother and I would go running in there, uh, grandpa's little dog would come up and like bite our shoes and stuff. And of course we'd start crying and grandpa would be laughing at us. But, uh, that's pretty much what I remember is my grandpa, um, having that little dog and he yeah. loved that dog. I don't know what it is. It seems like the little, the smaller, the dog, the meaner they get sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. With that one in particular, he would um, get ornery because uh, my grandparents used to go to the mall, you know, after they retired and stuff. That That's kind of the thing that they'd go have coffee and, you know, they knew half the people in town. So they'd just kind of go up there and visit. But they'd take the dogs and leave the windows cracked. In Wyoming, it doesn't really get too terribly hot. But uh, Curly, he'd get ornery. And uh, my grandpa used to keep toothpicks. He'd always have a toothpick in his mouth mm -hmm. or up in his ear or somewhere in a hat. Um, Curly got into his stash of toothpicks and he start he poked like 10 of them into the leather of his car. They were all oh like God. stuck in the side of the seat when my grandpa got back out. Cause I guess Curly was mad. He got left in the car. Yeah. Well, I've never heard of a dog sticking toothpicks into, yeah. into the seat of a he, car. He was a smart dog. But. I mean, I've heard of them, you know, peeing everywhere or, or making a mess on the shoes or, or whatever, but yeah, he was definitely, he was making that personal because, uh, he knew that my grandpa really, uh, really liked his toothpicks. So, yeah. Wow. Wow. Now, yeah. did, did you guys live uh, down the street or were you close? Or? Um, we were actually on the other side of town. We were on the east side of town and my grandparents were out on the west side of town. So it was a pretty good 30-minute uh, drive to get over there, which is a lot in Casper because um, sure. you're pretty much 15 minutes from everywhere. Right, right. So you guys were on the outskirts and they were on the outskirts on the other side. And Yeah. Okay. So you saw them pretty regular then. Yeah. Yeah, we sure did. Um, we'd go out there and just, you know, we'd spend weeks during the summer with them. Okay. Uh, sometimes when we were little, we'd take our bikes out there and, you know, ride them all around their neighborhood. They had a, a really big neighborhood, but it was really quiet because everybody kind of had like uh, one to three acres yeah. um, for their property. And it was out near the airport. It was like a five minute drive from the airport. And of course, my grandpa had his hangar out there. And uh, eventually, he got into racing aircraft. So oh, he wow. had um, purchased a T-6 Texan, which is an old okay. trainer aircraft used right. during World War II. Um, and he raced that in the Reno International Air Races for like 29 years, I believe. Wow. Wow. And so if... T6 racing is essentially like the stock car racing for air races. Everything, all the aircraft are supposed to essentially be identical in the classes. So he did a lot of that. And so he, he'd go to Reno every single year to uh, race. And yeah. uh, I never actually got to go to Reno to see him race there but he did we had an air show in casper one year and there was like a little bit of an expedit or exposition air air race that they did so i got to see him flying that oh cool and uh i went up with him i, I remember going up with him in a cessna a time or two but i never actually got a ride with him in the t6 like my brother did and all of my other cousins and stuff did but at the time when he was um, able to do that for everybody, I was off in the Marine Corps, so I okay. wasn't home to be able to uh, enjoy a lot of that with them. Go do that. But, yeah. Now, was there a story or, or do you remember what got your grandfather into aviation? I don't remember exactly what the story was, but I just remember like my uncle would tell stories about he would sit in his recliner with all of his binders 
um, and books and everything and studied to pass all of his flight exams. Okay. Um, so he, he was very dedicated to doing that. And I, I believe before that he was a welder because he, uh, would weld some random like metal or, or metallurgical art that is kind of common now, but it wasn't common back then. He, yeah. would, you know, take like old engine parts and he built, um, welded together this, um, basically it was a, it, the name of it was tired iron, which was also the name of the racing team that he was a pit crew member for before he got into racing himself. Okay. But essentially it was a guy that was carrying a wheel on top of his shoulder, but it was all made out of welded together engine parts and yeah. headlights and just random stuff. So, okay. um, yeah, he, he did a lot of welding and stuff prior to, uh, getting into aviation. Do you think, uh, was that maybe part of, uh, I don't know what they called it in, uh, back in the forties, but I know MOS, but was that his specialty, um, in the army or, um, no, I think he was actually infantry in the army and I know he did a lot of color guard related things. So there was, um, I believe I remember hearing a story about him actually teaching at the high school, some of the ROTC kids, how to do, you know, drill and color guard type activities. So, okay. So it sounded like he went in, uh, you know, underage, went in, did the infantry thing, kind of got over to Europe after uh, the war had officially closed, was part of the occupation forces in Germany for a while. Yeah. Um, in, in the security forces, because there's a lot of rebuilding. I mean, everything was flattened over there, um, all that kind of good stuff. Or not good stuff, but you know what I yeah. mean. There, there was uh, definitely a major effort to rebuild essentially the entire continent. Right. And then he was probably over there a couple of years and then came back. And yeah. And the reason I was asking that or in going through the little bit of a story is I had no idea if maybe being over there, he saw a lot of the P-38s or P-47s or P-51s or, you know, something that may have sparked his interest in aviation. Yeah, actually, that's um, a very good question and something I'll, I'll have to talk to my uncle about it. I bet he knows exactly what kind of got him on the kick because um, speaking of World War II, uh, additional World War II aircraft, he had uh, rebuilt a Mischerschmitt ME-109 okay. D. Um, and at one point he was taxiing down the runway and those aircraft are notorious for having the, because they have two landing gear in the front and then the, the smaller tail landing yeah. gear. Um, but the front landing gear on them would lock up all the time. The bearings would lock up. And that actually happened to him when he was taking off for its maiden test flight, locked up the landing gear and rolled the aircraft down the runway. And uh, he it cracked the engine block and my, he still had the helmet. It had a crack going all the way down Holy from cow. like his temple all the way over the top of the helmet. So he was lucky to have su- survived that. And he had pictures of that up in his hangar and everything. And then I remember when I was little, um, of course, he wasn't trying to rebuild it to try to fly it. He was rebuilding it as a museum piece. So okay. he had it set up in his his smaller hangar at the time before he moved to the big hangar that he was in for probably 25 years. Um, he was building that ME-109 and eventually got it good enough to where he was able to give it back to the guy that owned it. And... I think it got picked up by Airbus and Airbus actually rebuilt it and it, it they're flying it. Oh wow. But they they it's got to have very special weather conditions and everything before they'll even take it out cuz they don't do well in like crosswinds or things right. like that. Well, and uh I listened to another podcast that uh deals with some of the old warbirds and I know on uh, like B25s and uh B17s and things like that where um, those are the structures are getting so old that they make sure that they don't go as fast as those planes can go. They don't pull the, right. you know, stresses on them as much as they do. And it's fair weather flying for the most part. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know, it's a metal fatigue is a real thing and it, it affects aircraft and it affects anything the older something gets. Yeah. So, and that's kind of actually, I don't know if you remember, but during the Reno International Air Races, it must have been 
maybe 10 years ago. They had one of the P-51 Mustangs actually crash into the crowd there. Oh, yeah. And that was an issue where they had a part on the, I believe it was the elevators. And it was notorious for having trouble with that anyway, that particular aircraft was. But it broke off, so the the pilot essentially lost control of the aircraft and wasn't able to uh, pull out of it. To get it out. Yeah. 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 Interesting. So... uh, Tell me a little bit more about growing up with with your grandfather and then him growing this museum because it sounds like he had started doing the brush pilot and the uh, crop dusting, but then at some point he starts building out an air museum as well. Right. I'd say that um, kind of took off more after he retired. He had more time to accumulate things. Um, he kind of was a bit of a pack rat, I guess, over the years. He filled up an entire, a, a hangar that essentially was designed to house World War II bombers. Mm-hmm. He filled one of those with, you know, parts and pieces of history from uh, multiple wars, uh, okay. everything from a lot of aviation related stuff like instruments from aircraft and different types of training munitions and uh, weapons and things like that that would go on. You know, just a whatever he could essentially get his hands on, uh, he put it in the museum. And then he kind of dedicated a portion of it more towards Casper itself because um, okay. the airfield was, you know, built as a training base. And it um, a lot of B-24 Liberators were based out of there doing bombing training. Yeah, yeah. No, that that, that so. that's interesting. Now, how, how was that um, as a little kid seeing all those aircraft and, and oh, get, it was, you know, seeing all that what was, what was your impression with all that growing up? It was just amazing. Like I, I didn't realize it cause it was kind of normal for me to just walk into this massive hangar and see, you know, he's got T six over here and he's got somebody else's like little T 34 sitting off in a corner. He's got a biplane that he built himself hanging from the rafters, um, a MIG in that corner or two MIGs, actually. He owned two MIG-15s. Engine parts just kind of in random places all over the place. He's got a full wood shop and machine shop in the hangar. So, um, And then a big bus because he decided to take a Greyhound bus and convert it into his little motor home or motor coach, and that's what he would live in while he was at the Reno air races every year okay so did he have somebody fly the planes down or did he, oh, he fly flew, fly down and yeah. somebody else drove the coach down? his uh his ground crew would fly the or drive the bus down for him okay and so of course he had like a whole pit crew and everything that worked for him to keep the the airplane in shape to be able to race in the several heats that he would fly in every year well one i'm curious about the migs so i've got to ask you about them how, how did your grandfather get a hold of a couple of migs well, um, actually, they were out of Turkey. Uh, they were somehow probably sold by the Russians to the Turkish military. And then the Turkish military decommissioned them probably around the time when they started picking up some of our F-4s and stuff like that that we would post-Vietnam. Um, so when he got the aircraft, all of the instruments and everything were all in Turkish so he had them shipped in crates and okay so disassembled and then yeah they were completely disassembled uh, both of them and he had one of them that he was getting ready to he'd actually got it to the point where he could run it up and they were getting ready to test fly it Uh, of course my grandma was not very happy about that no um and then the uh the price of fuel went through the roof so he was like you know i would have definitely like to fly it but i didn't have you know thousand dollar bills to throw out the window while i was doing it so right right yeah no the the aviation fuel for those things is is got to be through the roof i know just what the warbirds you're talking a few hundred bucks for a half hour's worth of flying time not to mention the parts and the oil changes and the you know safety checks and everything else that has to go into it for such a short period of flying and jets you go through a lot more fuel than prop aircraft do yeah so he would have had um i don't think he could have afforded to fly it for very long at all if he 
But, no, uh, that, that would have been probably special air shows and, and commemorative right. stuff where maybe you could get donations and some other things to help keep it flying. Yeah. And then the second one, he kind of had it all painted up real nice as more of a museum piece. So it was painted, painted black and then it had red accents to it. Um, I've actually got a picture I can show you later. Okay. Um, but it, you know, he did like a hammer and sickle thing on the side of it and everything to be kind of, uh, in line with, you know, what the Soviets at the time would have potentially put okay. on it. Yeah. Cause those would have been kind of Korean war to early Vietnam yep. uh, era as far as active duty with the Soviets and, and their, their satellite countries. Yeah, they faced off against the F-86 Sabres, and then I think later on, the and they, they actually did a good job against the F-86, and that's why we ended up with the F-100 Super Sabre, I believe, that was a little bit faster and a little bit more maneuverable to be able to take on the MiGs. Sure. An interesting story was that I think it was you and your brother uh, made up some models, and then oh, yeah. your grandfather put those into the display cases at the at the museum. Right. You- and I, I believe it's probably still there. So um, my grandpa had a bunch of like they look immaculate, professionally done models of aircraft that are inside of his display cases for his museum. And uh, my brother and I ended up getting a B-17 model and we wanted to do it for grandpa's museum, put it in the display case. So, you know, my brother and I were probably, I don't know, eight and 10, nine and 11, something like that. So we're putting together this model and we're trying to hand paint it and everything. And it, it looked like hot garbage when we got done, (laughs) but my, my grandpa went ahead and he threw it in the display case with all of the other like pristine models and I think it's still in there today. Holy uh, cow! Because I, I saw it in there last time I was in the hangar, and laughed. But but how did that make you feel as a as a young kid? Where you were? I mean, you you were also probably recognizing at the time it's not perfect. There's seams where the wings come together. You probably got glue on the cockpit glass. You you know it, yeah, it was things that you normally do when you're a young kid putting these things together and the imperfections. But then that your grandfather took that. And then put it next to these, you know, essentially fine art, pro- professional grade models. How did that make you feel? Yeah, it it actually uh, surprised me uh, quite a bit. And it, it made me feel pretty good that, you know, to him, it's not about, you know, who made it or how good it looks or whatever. It's, you know, it's a model of a B-17, so he'll make space for it in his case. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking too. Is that that's got to be you know pretty special though that that this is something you and your brother worked on, and then knowing the blemishes and things that he made space for it and and put it into the case that hey, this is my grandson's work and, and effort here. Right. Yeah, and it it, it definitely uh, it felt pretty good to know that he cared enough to not care what anybody else like the public has access to this museum they walk through and they're they're looking at like oh man this is a really nice model of an f-14 tomcat and then they look over and they're like what in the heck happened here right it's like hand painted and you know yeah it's a couple of kids with their tester paint and and yeah. you know and, and glues and everything else and right you know but that that has to be a, a special memory though when your grandfather stuck that into the case yeah, no, it, it definitely was. Actually, I didn't know that he put it in the case until I went by our, it was like months later or something after we gave it to him as a, we gave it to him as a gift in like a big boot box or something. Okay. And then uh, we were going through the museum at some other point in time. We we're like, hey, you put it in the case. It's yeah. like, yeah, of course. So how did the relationship start to change and evolve as you went into your middle school and high school years? So then it kind of got a little bit like better, I would say, because grandpa didn't really know what to do with us when we were little. Mm-hmm. It was a, uh, there was a funny story actually about this one has to do with my brother, but uh, my mom had some errands to run or something and she left my brother with my grandpa and she's like, are you sure you're okay with him? Grandpa's like, sure, I'm okay with him. Um, but he had taken a, 
a rope and looped it through my brother's belt loop and tied him to a tree <laughs> and then went about his business mowing the lawn and stuff. And my mom came home and threw a fit apparently. But, uh, you know, my brother was fine. He might've had some mud on his face or something, but, uh, yeah, he, oh, that's funny. so grandpa didn't really know what to do with us until we started getting a little bit bigger. And then we would go out to the hangar and work on him with stuff. So I was out, you know, bending metal and grinding on stuff and pop riveting aluminum onto airplanes and laying under airplanes polishing um because we before he'd get ready for a race he'd polish up his t6 he was like i'm not sure if it makes me go faster but i'm not going to take a chance so crawl under there and get to buffing right but then he'd let me take the same buffer and go out and buff my truck okay so and he'd you know, periodically, if I was having trouble with my pickup, I'd drive out there and it, I'd pull it up in the hangar. And if he needed to, he'd just go like grab a forklift or something and lift up the back end of the truck. And, you know, he had a tool for everything, every situation. Is that where you started getting into, you know, some of your woodworking and metalworking? Yeah, a little bit. So, I, you know, I had, of course, shop classes in seventh and eighth grade. And then after that, I kind of knew enough to where I could go out there and I knew okay, that's, you know, a break for bending metal. And right. I know that, you know, I know how to gas weld and little bits and pieces like that. It was more where I actually applied some of that knowledge and I saw where it could come together, actually, you know, fabricating pieces of an aircraft and putting it together. And it, it was something small, like, like a little uh, block that was used to uh, prevent the canopy from sliding too far back or something like to that effect. But you know, it still had to be measured and um, cut and grinded and fabricated to fit perfectly. And, you know, had to drill a hole through it so he could get a bolt in it. And yeah, it starts yeah. to give you confidence on using the tools and then the application of that stuff. So exactly. It's it's not just theory like, oh, well, in theory, I could knock a hole in this wall and then block it out and put, you know, shelving or something in there. It's like, oh, you actually at a younger age get a chance to do some of that stuff, make some mistakes, but then see the practical side of what you're doing. Right. Yeah. And it, it kind of gave me or helped give me an appreciation for, you know, just fabricating and building stuff and fixing things because a lot of that stuff, they don't make parts for anymore. So you have to make your own parts and put it together. And, you know, I, I got a lot of that with my dad as well, working on cars and everything, but. Okay. So a good portion of it was at the hangar laying on my back underneath an airplane. Yeah. How did the relationship evolve even further as you started to get towards your, let's say, the junior, senior year of high school where, you know, you're getting closer to that point where you can move out, you join the Marines, you can do, uh, you know, you start to really spread your wings, let's say. So it was, um, of course, at that time I gotten a job and a girlfriend and all that stuff so i didn't have as much time to go and spend out at the hangar with him like i should have um so mostly it was you know we get together on holidays and you know stuff like that where um just spending time as family not so much as time spending time as you know a couple of guys out working in the hangar right did you uh sense that that window even at that age that that window was kind of closing down a little bit where you're not hanging out with grandpa as much you're not at the hangar as much you're but the but the relationship's maturing a little bit more yeah no it was i i can remember the first time like my grandpa offered me a beer okay he didn't drink at all but he was uh sponsored by new belgium for some small little thing in his air racing. So he always had a fridge full of fat tire, which was my favorite beer at the time. And okay. every time I'd come out to the hangar and see him, he'd pull one out for me. And yeah, is that a case now when you're seeing it at a bar or you're seeing it on the airplanes or whatever, where it's like, Oh yeah, that was my, my grandpa's beer. So right. to speak. Yeah. And this was before, you know, fat tire went nationwide. So I could only get it when I went back home. So it was always kind of a special treat. Okay. Yeah, it's it's amazing when I'm talking with people about the those little things similar to that where it may be a, a particular brand of uh, coffee or a particular brand of cigarette or a particular, you know, it's something where at the time you're not even thinking about it. But yeah. then 
you know, you, you move forward 10 years and it's like, Oh, right. This always reminds me of my grandfather. Yeah, exactly. Well, and now like when I see NASCAR on the TV, some, my grandpa was never into stock car racing. He Mm -hmm. was always all about airplanes. And then one day out of the blue, he got a call from Jeff Gordon's agent or somebody that handles Jeff Gordon's affairs because, uh, Jeff Gordon, JG, Jim Good, JG, my grandpa had, um, the tail number on one of the biplanes that he built and it, he didn't fly it or anything anymore. It was hanging up in his hangar and didn't have an engine in it, but the number on that airplane was JG 24. So Jeff Gordon's agent actually got in touch with him. They were trying to purchase the tail number from him. And my grandpa was like, Oh, I don't fly that airplane anymore. You can just have the tail number. It's not a big deal, but I don't think he knew who Jeff Gordon was. Mm -hmm. And then I, to thank him for that, he got all like a whole package of signed hats and, um, like stickers and, you know, everything you would think that basically memorabilia signed by Jeff Gordon and just showed up one day. And then all of a sudden grandpa's a big NASCAR fan and Jeff Gordon's his favorite driver. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. It was, uh, it was kind of comical for me, but yeah, he, he didn't paint up any of his cars or his planes as a rainbow warrior. No, no, none of that. (laughs) He did actually paint all of his, he did all of his own paint work on his aircraft. Um, his T six had a really nice, like, red, white, and blue pattern. It still does. Um, and the name of the aircraft is a uh, Wyoming Wildcatter. So oh, okay. he did all of his paint work on that. And then a lot of other people that owned airplanes would come to my grandpa and ask him to paint. So he always had somebody's airplane in the hangar that he was doing paint work on, and he did all the the paint work on that one Mig as well. Got it. Got it. Yeah, it's. It's amazing that that whole flying community and Warbird community is pretty close knit. I mean, everybody knows everybody in that space. So, uh, getting to have the opportunity to work on other people's planes is is kind of a it, it's an it's an honor. But then it also speaks to having such a good reputation with that work that they do. They all kind of help each other out. Um, of course, I never made it out to Reno to see how it really worked, but I'm sure. You know, if somebody was having a hard time getting their aircraft back up to race or something, they would all jump in and help them out because, I mean, these guys are racing these aircraft. They It costs a lot of money to do it, and mo- they're probably none of them are independently wealthy, so they're all just kind of scraping whatever they can get together. And, you know, the cost of anything on an aircraft is like quadruple what it is on a car. So yeah. even just an oil change is outrageous right tires and landing gear and tool i mean probably even tools even yep gets to be a specialized one-off kind of fabrication just even for the tools exactly to do it. now how did the relationship with your grandfather change as you uh, got out of high school and started those young adult years well so i pretty much would make it a habit to go and see him every time I came home on leave, him and grandma both. And he actually helped me buy my first car after I was in the Marine Corps. I was at home on boot leave recruiter's assistance. And I found my, uh, I had a 95 Pontiac Firebird formula Firehawk that I just couldn't live without, Mm -hmm. but I couldn't get a loan for it because, you know, I thought that, you know, being an E1 in the Marine Corps, having a guaranteed paycheck meant that people would give me a loan, but they didn't. So I went and talked to my grandpa about it and he actually helped me out. He went in, asked him, you know, what their cash price was on it. So he bought the car for me and then I paid him back the same payments that I would have paid on the loan. Like a, yeah, bank. And that's interesting too, because I've had a number of people talk about where their grandfathers were essentially their first bank. Um, yeah. you know, whether it's helping to buy an old pickup truck or, you know, your car or in, anything else where the idea that grandpa, you know, you've got some savings and things, but that's where you also learn that when you borrow money, you've got to pay it back. Right. Yeah. And it, it came time, uh, I was getting ready to purchase my first truck and I wanted to keep the car, but I wanted to pay it off before. Uh, I bought the truck, so I'd saved up enough money to where I could pay it off, or I thought I could anyway. So I called up my grandpa, and I was like, I don't, I I mean, I I can add up what 
I made for payments, but at the time, like calculating the interest and all that craziness, he's like, nah, just, just pay me the, the difference in the principal. He's like, I don't want any interest out of you. So that was pretty nice. I got an interest free loan for my first car. Nice. But it's, but it was still, it was still that learning experience of, Hey, I've got to make the monthlies. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and I've got to do that stuff. So that that's a, that's a fantastic opportunity and experience that you had with that. Yeah, no, it was definitely good. There was only one little hiccup, and it was due to I, – I didn't pick up training out here at Fort Belvoir when I was supposed to, so they actually sent me back home again on recruiter's assistance. But the problem was I had just gotten paid, and I needed enough money to drive my car all the way back. And I did it in two days. I only stopped in one hotel room yep. for like 36 hours worth of driving. It was kind of dumb, but I did that, you know, essentially because I knew I had to make that payment and got out there. And, you know, I, I was just short enough in my bank account. The payment didn't go through. So I called up my grandma and let her know, hey, I've got cash. I'm going to come out and pay you. And she's like, oh, no, I, I see the payment here. It went through. But it was one of those where it was, you know, they sent the payment through but then they realized that there wasn't enough funds to cover it so they pulled it back and charged me whatever ridiculous fee for right. not having the funds to cover it and they were fine like i went out there and tried to give them the cash and everything and they're like no no it's fine you know you just got home you need the money and so they let me skip a payment one time due to that error with the uh or not having the money in the account yeah and you know, of course, back then I couldn't, you couldn't go to an ATM and deposit money. So, right. Yeah. You end up with that check and, and you got to just find a branch or find something yeah. where you can get and I, it. Into. I was a Pacific Marine Federal Credit Union. And the only place where they had branches were, was on the West Coast. And then I got stationed out here on the East Coast. So eventually I switched to Navy Fed and that helped a little bit. But it, it's always interesting when you have this regional or, or pretty small branches and, yeah. and then you, you move somewhere else and it's like oh yeah closest branch is 1500 miles away right yeah it was a scam that they did to all of us boot marines mm -hmm. when we were in san diego for recruit training well how how did things end up with you and your grandfather as because he passed in around 2009 or so is that uh, right? or? 2016 actually. 2016 yeah. okay Okay. So how was the relationship towards, um, towards the end or, or as, you know, as you guys moved further down the road, as you got older and he got older? So, uh, the first time I ever saw my grandpa slow down, cause after he retired, he was con he worked every day, like going to the hangar was his job. He took Sundays off, I think. The only time I saw him slow down was when my grandma uh, started getting dementia. And of course she got to the point where she couldn't be left alone. So he wasn't able to do a lot of the same stuff that he was doing before. So when I get home, I'd, you know, of course go and visit them. And um, it's really sad. It got to the point where my grandma didn't recognize me or anybody else. She only recognized my grandpa. So she would get really anxious when he, he wasn't around. Right. So he kind of uh, slowed down enough and was, you know, spending more time with grandma at the house, just taking care of her and making sure she didn't blow up the microwave and sure. stuff like that. Sure. What was one of the biggest takeaways you had from that relationship that you've either learned about that you want to pass on eventually to your grandkids or what was one of the big things about that relationship that I guess really stuck to your heart? So it, for me, it really comes down to work ethic and knowing that if you work hard enough at what you want, you can achieve it and do whatever you want. Because, you know, I watched my grandpa that after getting out of the army when he was probably 18 um, and then just doing odd jobs or whatever, met my grandma. He was a cowboy for a while, I think, too. Mm -hmm. I got pictures of him sitting up on a horse. Okay. But, uh, and then he was able to progress through to the point where, you know, he essentially retired from Amico Pipeline and, um, made enough of a living for himself that he was able to do whatever he wanted, which was race airplanes. And I think that's kind of what really stuck with me growing up and, you know, knowing that you got to work for what you want. Nobody's going to give it to you. 
So if there's something that you want to achieve, just work towards it and you can do it. The other thing too with that is that I'm sure along the way is that there were, there was dreams and aspirations with how he moved all the way through that that progress right from from being that cowboy being the per, the 18 year old it's weird saying being out of the army at 18 yeah it, normally it's, it's you're going in at 18 right and but, i think uh my grandma had my uncle when she was probably 18 years old so mm. they had kids at a fairly young age uh, my grandpa was i think four years older than my grandmother though okay but, but still still pretty young and you know, and where I was going with that was that he had a dream that came out of his uh, his occupation. So he he taught himself to fly. He was obviously interested in that, and and worked his way to becoming that pipeline pilot. Yeah, he made a living doing what he loved. Yeah, and and then trans moved that over to a museum and moved that into racing the airplanes. And having a pretty good life all the all the way through. Yep. So now, as we wrap up, uh, what's a piece of advice or, or what's something that you would suggest to other grandfathers to help build out a great relationship with their grandsons or daughters? I'd say it it really is just the little things. You spend time with them, you know, pop, pop a bag of popcorn with them. Or like in my grandpa's case, he had a special pan that he used to make his popcorn in and then kept a supply of brown paper bags to dump it in when he was done. But it's, it's all those little things that your grandkids are going to remember about, you know, growing up around you and, you know, they'll, they may take it for granted at the time, but it'll become more important to them as they get older and look back on things. Well, Brian, I really appreciate the time you've taken to uh, talk with me this evening and, and these stories about your grandfather and, uh, folks, what we're going to do is we'll put uh, links into the Air Museum. We'll probably put a couple of pictures on the website of some of the aircraft. And so what you want to do is you want to go to the website and check those things out after you listen to the podcast. Thanks again for spending this time with me and uh, have just really appreciated this conversation. Thanks a lot, Clark. I appreciate it. Man, what a great conversation with Brian. It was so interesting to hear about his grandfather's life. And the big takeaway that I had is that we're not locked into just one career path or one direction in our lives that's that's set in our early 20s. You know, just because you went to dental school doesn't mean you have to remain a dentist. Just because you go and get an MBA doesn't mean you have to stay in a corporate route. There are so many great great examples of doing artwork, of doing so many different activities and hobbies, and then turning those hobbies into something that pays for itself, as well as the opportunity just to network and get to know people of similar interests. So what a great example and what great stories and takeaways out of this conversation. If you guys like this be sure to share this within your network and be sure to go to the website, check out the show notes. You guys are going to love checking out these small YouTube videos as well as the pictures of Brian's uh, grandfather's airplanes. Thank you for listening to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do me a favor and share it with a friend. That's the best way you can help us to expand our community, as well as get the news out about how valuable grandpas are in the lives of those kids. If you'd like to leave me a comment or shoot me a potential topic for this uh, podcast, please go to www cool-grandpa.us look for the comments tab fill it up hit submit it's as easy as that until next time remember to stay cool